That's right, folks. If you're looking at this, and uh, I'm sure there's going to be tons of people that are going to look at this or, or not, uh, the video says, I am not an anarchist. For many of you that know me, that may come as a surprise to you. For those of you who maybe see my YouTube videos, it might not be such a surprise. But I'm going to explain what I mean when I say I am not an anarchist. My name is Paul Gordon, and I am with iState.tv. And I guess this is, hmm, I don't know. I'm going to call this, uh, this is an iState podcast, although it might be a short podcast. I don't know. It might be 15 minutes long. It might be 30 minutes long. I have no idea how how long it's going to be. And for those of you that may have been watching this on Facebook, I'm not going to be responding to the to the comments there because I don't want to interrupt my train of thought because I want to say something that for me is pretty important. I'm not an anarchist. Nope, not. To me, an anarchist is uh, someone who believes with absolute certainty that you can get rid of the state. And if you and, and 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 believe me, when I'm describing what I'm dis, you know how I'm defining anarchist, I am absolutely not claiming an absolute standard for how others should define what anarchist means. So don't don't whip out your your dictionaries on me or your etymological history of the of the word anarchist. I don't care. I'm just telling you how I relate to the word anarchist. It means that you absolutely believe that you can end the state and that in ending the state that, well, I mean, it's, it's, you know, that the state doesn't, is not a reflection of human nature, that you could end the coercive enterprise or coercive associations. I think I'm going to start referring to them more as coercive associations, <laughs> but uh, you, you can end the coercive association and human beings won't automatically build something to replace it. I'm not 100% sure that that is actually going to happen. I'm not 100% sure exactly what is human nature. I understand that the coercive association, if you will, it doesn't emerge until... I'm not sure... Well, actually, we used to believe that the coercive associations emerged with the start of farming, but now we have evidence that suggests that coercive associations may have actually started a little bit before farming, or maybe they don't, well, it has to do with uh, some of the evidence of a ancient, uh, ancient, uh, I don't know, uh, religious centers found in Turkey that suggests that maybe, maybe there was a course of association that was happening but regardless of when it happened or how it happened, at some point, coercive associations begin to emerge throughout the world. And the question is, did coercive associations emerge because of the conditions? Like as, as, more, as, there became, as there came to be more human beings, as more human beings were occupying a more dense space, this type of interaction did it produce in in humans naturally through their biology that this is always going to be what happens when you have a certain amount of humans got it I, I don't know i'm not saying it is or it isn't and i'm definitely not saying whether i know what will happen if you suddenly take away the coercive associations what will happen will human beings automatically build them uh is it possible for us to slowly incrementally get away from from the whole idea of a coercive association because i i think most most of the uh, most anarch anarchists would probably agree if you suddenly took away all of the power of coercive associations today human beings who fundamentally have a coercive association mindset uh throughout most parts of the world whether it's through conditioning or nature or some combination thereof they're going to rebuild a coercive association pretty quickly and when I'm saying course of association, course of association equals state or some form thereof. So I am saying that, nope, I am not an anarchist. I'm not saying I'm an anarchist. I'm not using that word. I don't give a crap. 
I just don't care. That's not a cross that I'm going to die on or a hill that I'm, whatever. Not, you know, it's, a, it's not a hill I'm going to die on. Yeah, I'm not going to die on the, on the hill that is, I must use the word anarchist, and I must proclaim that I'm an anarchist. I don't. I don't need it. I don't need the word. I really don't need any words. I need action much more than I do words. But words are useful. They're useful in communicating with others, and I'm definitely interested in communicating with others. And I'm very interested in communicating with people outside of, outside of Anarchotopia, right? Thank you. Nice spooks. That's right. James Weeks is commenting here, and he said, nice spooks, nerd. Right, exactly. I, I, I don't, I don't want to live hiding behind spooks. I want to stand on my own preferences. And this is in part why I'm making this video. I'm, I'm actually going to be standing on my own preferences. And my own preferences, well, I'll just tell you at, at core, first of all, this is my starting point. My starting point is I desire to be able to make the choice to, to take the type of action that I wish to take without influence from the threat or actual physical force in as much as that is possible. I don't know how much that is possible. I mean, even if I lived in the woods, there's still this element of having to weigh out the cost of a, a physical, a potential physical threat to myself, whether it's from animals or physics or whatever. So I'm, I'm, that's not an absolute statement. But in as much as possible, I wish to remove physical force from the equation as far as making the decision that I wish to make as far as the action I'd like to take. Whatever that makes me, I don't really care. That's my preference. That is my core preference when it comes to, I'm going to say, human interaction. That's, that's the world that I wish to see. And because that is my core preference, I have come to some assumptions about the world around me. And this is, a, I, I, I'm not claiming that, you know, the stuff that I'm going to suggest to you that I believe is totally, absolutely right. I, I don't know. I, 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 feel, I feel pretty good about the things that I'm about ready to say, but I don't have 100% certainty. I, I believe that if I am going to have an opportunity to have the least amount of of physical of threat of physical force applied to me uh that might alter my actions otherwise i believe that i have to have people around me that have well it's 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 one of two paths one path is i have to have superhuman powers to be able to resist all all physical coercion uh, uh around me so if for instance, my neighbors decide that it's okay to uh, go and press a button somewhere that somehow will lead others to interpret that they may how have the right to send out people with weapons of force to alter my my preference, my the action that I'd like to take through my preference. Uh, well then it doesn't matter. I, I can just superhumanly just poof. I don't have to deal with you, man. I will just supernaturally throw you away. But I don't have that. I understand the limitations of the reality of my own power. And the reality of my own power is if people show up with guns, I'm in trouble. So when people with this this legitimization given to them by my neighbors uh, offer a threat to me, uh, implicit or impl implicit or explicit. I tend to pay attention because I know that in reality of power that I cannot physically meet them head on and eliminate that threat. So that means that. <laughs> If my neighbors around me have this notion, have this idea that it's okay for them to, in one way, shape, or form, whether it's to, you know, one day a year show up at some room somewhere and, and pull a magic lever or press a magic button that's going to somehow give legitimization to people using force to stop me from doing something that doesn't hurt someone else, well, 
I'm screwed, dude. I I know right away that 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 my my ability to meet my 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 core preference, which is again to be able to make a decision that I want to make a decision about my life, to take an action that I'd like to take with the least amount of, of physical uh, threat uh, hindering that choice. I know I know full well that that means that. My choice is limited. Uh, my choice is significantly limited. In the world that I live in today, my choice is significantly limited as to the action that I can choose to take that doesn't involve a threat of physical force. Like, for instance, I mean, an easy one. You say taxation is theft. I don't want to go down that road. Um, I'm, I'm just going to say that I'm against taxation. It does not align with my core preferences. <laughs> I'll just say that. And I know full well that when I send money to these entities, to these coercive associations, that they're going to do stuff with them that I fundamentally disagree with. They are going to, they're doing it right now. I know that some of the money that I give them, whether it's the money that I give to them when I'm making a purchase or the money I give them April 15th, whatever the case might be, I know that money is going to be used to bomb the hell out of other people that I'd rather not get bombed, to kill people that I rather would not get killed. So what is my choice? I, I can choose. I do have the choice. I am not being totally controlled by these guys. I'm not being, they, 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 they really can't take my action for me. I am not a, a automaton that they have the power to, you know, magically make me uh, send a tax in. I am choosing to say, listen, dude, I'm going to go ahead, even though they're using my money to kill people, I am going to, to work in my own interest to preserve myself, and I am going to go ahead and send that tax in. I own that. I own that I made that choice. It's not a great choice. Not 100% proud of the choice that I've made. But uh, as far as within my my with within the framework of my preferences, it, it aligns. It absolutely aligns. But I know that if my neighbors around me suddenly don't feel like it would be an unnatural thing, it would be a weird thing to to go and and to a room somewhere and and pull a magic lever and press a magic button that somehow legitimized people using lethal force or the threat of lethal force against me merely because I was taking an action that that they didn't like that they didn't approve of it wasn't an action that was hurting someone else and I mean directly hurting someone else I'm not messing around with the you know three four seven fifteen times removed down the road somehow my action you know because because we could play that game and in that and in that case every single thing that any one of us does harms someone else therefore every single thing we do by that standard the government should somehow magically have the right to uh take action against and by the way that's exactly the what what they've done you know that whole uh uh the 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 commerce clause <laughs> the commerce clause opened that door wide for them to to make the connections everything is interconnected so therefore the government has a right to 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 control everything because everything could potentially hard every harm everything and as a matter of fact everything does harm everything Every single thing that is done harms something else. <laughs> Every action has uh, a negative uh, side effect. So now I'm getting finally to the heart of, of uh, hopefully I've set this up enough to, to, so that you can see where I'm coming from. I've, I've outlined I'm standing on my preference, plain and simple. I'm not standing on a ghost. I'm not standing on a spook. I'm not standing on some mythological... Uh, objective morality I am standing on Paul's simple preference that I'd rather be able to take charge of my own life as much as possible without threat of uh, coercive action force affecting my decisions so that's my preference I'm not saying that it's right I'm not saying it's wrong I'm not saying it's objective I'm saying that's Paul's freaking preference 
So there, I'm standing on my preference. And now, once I stood on my preference, I look at the world around me and I realize, you know, if the, 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 the more other people around me come to an understanding or uh, come to, let's just say, come to share my preference, the preference that, hey, they too would like to have their action not as influenced by, by physical force. And they'd like to, to see it lessened as much as possible. Keep going, keep going, keep going. So in that vein, and with these two things in mind, I've come to the conclusion that people around me need to have the same power that I have. And if they don't, I am not going to get very far in satisfying my own core preferences. This is why I say I'm not an anarchist. I'm not I'm not I'm not fighting. I'm not having a debate with people over whether there should be a state or not a state. That's not my concern. My concern is to see individuals and free associations as opposed to coercive associations gain more and more power. Now, in that vein I call myself a vis provusian. So, that's right. Paul's freaking preferences, Spike Cohen said, and you're absolutely right. I stand unabashedly, unashamedly, unapologetically on my core preferences. Now, in that vein, I call myself a vis provusian, which is a word that I coined. It's a, I think it's called a portmanteau where you take one word and combine it with another word. In this case, I'm taking one Latin word and combining it with another Latin word. And the first Latin word is vis, which means power. And previous, which means individual, individual power. And I expand that out to, to kind of uh, include free association power. Because free association power is the ultimate. It, it gives power ultimately to the individual to decide, am I part of this association? Am I not part of this association? So a free association power has by its very nature an implicit power of the individual uh, uh, folded right into it. So in that vein, I want to describe to you my understanding of what power is. And again, this is, this is my interpretation of the word power. I, I'm not looking up a dictionary, and I'm not going to argue with someone that wants to tell me, you know, how Lord Acton described power or how Webster's Dictionary described power. This is when I say power. This is how I'm using the word power. If there's if there's any reflection of of shared experience, I'll say within, as my friend Andrew Marich Bodie likes to say, within the human aggregate, then then what I say will resonate. And maybe other people will use power in the same way. Maybe they won't. I don't care. So for me, power is simply the ability to influence and take action. That's power to me. The, the ability to influence and take action. And there are what I'm identifying as, and, and this is subject to change, but I have thought about this now. I've, I've been thinking about this for about six months or so now, going over this again and again. And so far, I still have only identified four major spheres of 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 influence the first sphere is social social influence this is a very 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 powerful uh form of influence as a matter of fact you're seeing i can look at the you know you stand for the flag you stand for the flag of the united states of america and if you don't salute that flag or if you burn that flag Something bad's going to happen to you. You, me, you know, the cops might not show up, I and mean, they might, but most likely the cops might not show up. But you can expect, if enough people see what you've done, you can expect some really powerful, in this case, negative social influence pounded upon you. On the other side of that, if you stand for the flag and you salute and you, you give a rah-rah cheer, you can expect a lot of positive social influence from people around you. That is a, a powerful motivator to incentivize people, even at a very subconscious level, towards an action or away from an action. You will tend to not want to develop thoughts even, for instance, that take you down a road in which you know that you may be led through those thoughts to take actions that 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 will cause you to to suffer 
a negative social influence. On the other side of that, you know there are certain thoughts that lead to actions that will lead to positive social influence. So social influence is incredibly powerful. And then you have uh, you have ideational influence. Now, ideational influence is also very, very powerful. Ideational influence is it's, it's ideas. It's, okay, right now we have a very powerful ideational influence. The degree to which social influence helped it or not, I, well, certainly social influence a lot. Ideational and social influence can work hand in hand with one another. And in most cases, by the way, you are going to get a lot of, you're, you're not going to look at a situation and say, oh, yeah, that's purely social influence. There's, a, there's, there's almost always there's a mesh of influences involved. But ideational influence is ideas that, that, that ideas alone can prevent you from taking action or can lead you to take an action. It can influence your action one way or another. And really, one of the most powerful ideational influences there are in America today that stands between me seeing my ability to increase as far as satisfying my own core preference, which is to be to be able to choose to take action with the least amount of threat of, of physical force possible, is the, the, the idea of rule of law. Rule of law is this idea that in a land where you have a small number of people who are writing rules and regulations and edicts and fines, whatever, making uh, judicial decisions, judgments about oh, how this law is applied or that a law is applied or uh, whether, how, you know, the degree to which you may or may not have violated this law. There is this idea somehow this, that, that rule of law, is 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 this magical wall that protects individuals from being oppressed by the state and most people will even acknowledge well it doesn't do it perfectly of course there's some sort of uh you know violations that occur but really you know without rule of law they would they would show up at our doors and shoot our kids in the head and this idea that rule of law somehow keeps the savages from fully savaging us. Now, you think about the fact that it, the, the, the very idea of rule of law, I believe, discredits the coercive association in the first place. Because if you believe that you have to have this idea of rule of law to keep people at bay from ripping you to shreds, then you have to acknowledge that the very system that you're supporting tends to produce people that will rip you to shreds and tends to put them in positions of power where they might be able to do so. But rule of law is it's, it's a powerful influencer that, that, that cripples action against coercion against the threat of physical coercion even, before, before it, or, or it ever begins. It's like you had Obamacare. And when, when Obamacare first came into being in 2010, and uh, then you had the, the ruling, uh, I forget when the, when, when was the ruling for Obamacare? Was it uh, 2012? I don't, I don't remember. But you had the ruling by the Supreme Court. Well, first of all, you had the action of Obamacare. And what happened with Obamacare was suddenly the state was taking over a significant part. I mean, well, it wasn't. It was already. It, it, it has already been well entrenched in the healthcare system, bigly, much more than people even realize. Uh, but be that as it may, they took they they increased that 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 uh, that territory. Uh, significantly they moved into an area where they were now going to decide who lives and who dies they're trying to decide who lives or who dies at birth and at death and that's that's what you got to do if you if you want to control your farm animals you got to figure out when you know the ones that get to live and the ones that have outlived their usefulness and need to die and the response from the conservatives 
the conservatives, the limited government, rule of law, bill of rights people, when this happened, when this fundamental violation of the bill of rights occurred, and I'm I'm just being a devil's advocate here and using these terms. When that happened, what did the conservatives do? They said, rule of law, no, rule of law, we'll stop it. Rule of law, yes, rule of law. And so because of this myth of rule of law, they don't understand that there is no rule of law, there is only rule of power. Because of this myth of rule of law, it made them feckless feckless before the battle ever began so in instead of applying real power and in this case real power could have simply been I'm just not going to pay hey you know we're all gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna network we're gonna organize we're gonna as a mass we are going to let the state know we're not paying this we're not participating in this you're gonna have to come after millions of us they didn't do that they didn't do it because they felt safe they felt like they had this this place where they could go to called rule of law. And they went through the process and they they were sure. You know, George Bush he put he put uh, Chief Justice Roberts in and you know, now yeah, we got our guy. Oh yeah, we're going to Obama's going to shoot this down. You know, I don't, I don't know that they read article 1 section 8 of the the constitution which uh gives really really broad powers to to the government to levy taxes. It doesn't give any restrictions at all. I mean, I know in 1913 there was the 16th amendment that officially officially made income tax a thing that was now constitutional. But but really, they had the power beforehand. It was written into the Constitution. They could tax you any way that they want. There was never a limitation on how or why they taxed you. So had I known that at the time, I would have realized, um, <laughs> dude, they, by your own Constitution, by your own rule of law, it's not, it's, it's not, it's not against rule of law. The the, constant, the 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 government of the United States of America, the coercive association that we all belong to. Uh, unwittingly or wittingly, uh, has the power to levy taxes with no restrictions, no definitions about how they can or how they can't uh, levy taxes. And Obamacare is simply a whole bunch of taxes. And tax law is, 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 tax law is essentially, if you really want to get down to it, tax law is simply a form of human action regulation that's all it is and it has this nice payoff for the state because it gives them revenue but they don't really need revenue because they can just print it but that's another story at any rate this this idea of, of rule of law is prevented people from understanding the full nature of the reality of power around them it makes them soft and docile and it and it lowers the cost of coercion for the state because, hey, instead of facing 100 million conservatives across the country that are now daring you to show up at their door and try to collect these taxes, they, they, they're facing, I don't know, maybe 50,000 or so conservative activists that are showing up at town halls and, and protests, a Tea Party protests and all that. And then you had the ruling. And then you had the ruling in which Obamacare was upheld. And what did they do? You know what? They had another. They had another ideational myth. The Republic. The Republic. We are a Republic. We are a representational government of the people, by the people, for the people. All we have to do is win elections. And then, you know, the, they, they won the elections. And uh, Obamacare is still here. <laughs> what a surprise. What a surprise. Obamacare is still here. And is, have they gathered up the hundred million to say, that's it. We're not doing this. No, they're still thinking, no, no, no. There's still a way, man. We can do this. We got rule of law. We got the republic. I mean, you, you, you just think about the idea that a small group of people, I don't know, 500 or so people got together and said, hey, Let's rob 350 million people of, of uh, I, I don't know how much all the Obamacare taxes or whatever 
uh, take in. But but let's say this is probably low balling, but let's just say it's a hundred billion dollars. That's still friggin' a lot of money, at least where I come from, $100 billion. Let's rob 350 million people of $100 billion, dude. Dude, we do not have a military force that's able to do that. And besides, what you're talking about doing, this is like, this is something conservatives are like out of their mind that they won't accept, dude. This is, oh, no, no, dude, rule of law, rule of law, man. Rule of law is our mighty sword. We don't have to send out hundreds of thousands of troops to to get people to send in their money. We just send out rule of law. We just send out my flag and my my national anthem and football playing and you know doing the you know oh another military hero story you know uh, little Sally cries when daddy comes home from war. That's what we do. That's all we gotta do. See, it's so much cheaper that way. So I, I, I maybe I went in a little long on the ideational thing, but ideational power is is very, 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 very powerful. And I, I you know what? I'm not, I want to say one more example here because I think this this is actually it was doing this research that really got me thinking along a lot of the ways that I'm thinking now, and that is the Peasants' Revolt of 1381. I'm not going to give all the details of this, but essentially the Peasants' Revolt of 1381, they decided to enact a poll tax. And the peasants didn't like it, so they revolted. They kicked some serious butt. The power, as far as they had all the social uh, influence power, they had all the uh I, I, I'll, I'll get into this later, what I mean when I say this, but they had demonstrable power, and they even had physical force power all of these three things were in their favor and there they were on uh, i think it, what was it called miles end whatever field they were on facing uh, a 14 year old king and uh, the 14 year old king says you know king uh oh, what the heck is his name now <laughs> Drawing a blank. I don't care what his name was. The dude says, or they say to the guy, dude, we want our rights. We want this. And, and he says, listen, man, I'm the king. You know, you know, divine right of kings. Divine right of kings. That was the powerful. That was the most powerful idea that, that lowered the cost of coercion for the coercive association at that time. The divine right of kings. Now we don't have the divine right of kings. It's been replaced by rule of law here in America. <laughs> so, yeah, ideational power, incredibly, incredibly powerful. And now I'll get to the third one because I mentioned it here, and that is demonstrable power. And and this is the area that I think that, what do you want to call yourself, an anarchist, a minarchist, a limited government person, or me, a Vespervusian, uh, whatever you want to call yourself, if you are foreseeing the state significantly reduced. And also, I'll add this caveat, if you're not afraid of going where the reality of power takes you. So if, say, you're an minarchist and you believe, no, I just got to have a minarchist, you know, got to have a, a minimum government. And if you're a limited government guy and you believe you have a little bit more uh, government than the minarchist does, but in your heart you're like you know, but but you know if if you could show me through the reality of power that people can actually function and govern themselves, if you will, if they could settle disputes among themselves, if commerce can take place, if 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 that can happen without the course of association, great, I'll go down that path. So if if you fall into that category, then this is the area demonstrable influence that I think we have the greatest opportunity to, to make real headway. Real headway that eventually will start to turn into social uh, influence, will start to turn into even ideational influence. When you start to see ideas of free associations actually lived out and producing valid counters to what the coercive association has to ha has to offer people are going to be interested in that alternative and in the beginning it's not going to be uh it's not an all or nothing thing so you have health care have, we have all kinds of opportunities in america when it comes to health care offering free association solutions to 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 obamacare and we even have uh 
I mean, uh, I, I don't, I don't want to appeal to authority, but you know, recognizing the reality of power, there are even laws out there that exist that allow for these free association alternatives to happen to take place. You can have, uh, they're called, uh, they're called mutual. Uh, assurance associations. You can form these mutual assur assurance associations. Do powerful things. You could. You could be. You could get yourself exempted from a lot of coercive association type stuff. Education, of course. Uh, there's there's all kinds of opportunities still still in America. There's, you know, you can homeschool. You can unschool. You could form your own free associations where you will help one another. Uh, educate your kids. Uh, then there is the the technological part. Now here I'm giving to a certain degree. Uh, healthcare involves uh, technological advances that, in in a lot of ways, make it easier for us to form these free associations. But a lot of it, it it's it really about it's 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 just it's just associating itself that makes it powerful. In in education, it's associating itself that makes it powerful. But there are technological advances at what as well that that undermine the idea that you need to have some sort of central authority that forms a coercive association of everyone that lives in its geographical region, whether they want to be a part of it or not. And so you have the advances of 3D printing and how individuals are going to be able to 3D print their own stuff. Small associations. You will be able to build stuff and, and and products and services that right now are 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 still more cheaply made at at higher large scale levels. And then the large the larger the scale of the of the enterprise these days, the more more likely that enterprise is pretty much entangled with the course of association itself. They're almost one at this point. So so you have. 3D printing. You have you have advances in 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 cryptocurrencies, whether it's Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Monero, and and what's really scary is is well, not to me. It's not. It's wonderful. The most scariest thing is the idea that you will be able to communicate with others across mesh networks. That will afford, I don't believe that, I don't know if we'll ever achieve complete anonymity, but it will afford a high level of anonymity for individuals. That will make it extremely expensive for a coercive association to try to figure out who did what. They can figure out eventually, I, I think, maybe they can, maybe they can't, but they they. There's a fair chance that they could figure it out eventually, but if if okay, if they're only facing one individual or a few individuals that they really need to figure out who's doing this, okay, that's one thing. But if it's thousands of people, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people that are involved in these in these mesh networks that are doing it anonymously, they're they're trading with one another anonymously. They're they're totally outside the system, and the state doesn't have the resources to try to track them all down. Dude, that's going to fundamentally undermine the credibility of uh, the course of association. It's certainly, at the very least, whether it uh, it undermines it to a level where it's completely looked at and said, oh, we got to totally jettison this, or whether it's undermined to the greatest, oh, well, like 99% of what it does, it's 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 not needed. I don't, I, I don't know. I don't know because I don't fully know human nature, and I don't think any of us does. I'm going to say that. No, no. I'm, I don't want to say that uh, absolutely, but it, that would be one of my statements. If I was going to make an absolute statement, that'd be, uh, I, that would be a statement I might want to make. But I'm not going to make it here. I'm going to say I feel really good in saying it's pretty much certain that no one fully understands human nature. So we don't know. We don't know the degree to which human beings are going to still need that that. What, whatever it is that a course of association provides for them, I don't know the answer to that, and that's why I'm not. That's why I'm not so concerned about the word anarchy. That's why I'm not so concerned about calling myself an anarchist. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna die on that hill. The hill that I am gonna die on is whatever I can do in my life, especially my own personal life for my own personal interest, to tilt the balance of power towards individuals and free associations. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do it very pragmatically. And this is why 
uh, people who may see my content, maybe my content's going to change a little because it's it's going to become more focused towards this idea of tilting the balance of power and having that conversation with as many people as I possibly can. I don't want to just talk to a bunch of anarchists and minarchists even. I even want to talk because I believe that there are areas where there are progressives who would like to have the power to choose without threat of course of action. I want to work with them on that. And same thing with conservatives. I, I want to work with them on that. Wherever I can get people to experience what I personally believe, I'm not going to say objectively, but you know my personal value system, the, to experience the joy of being able to choose to take an action with the least amount of threat of, of physical uh, uh, coercion as possible. Um, th th these are people that are, I believe that th there are, there are areas where conservatives are, are, are more than happy to, to call out the guns. And there are areas where progressives are more than happy to call out the guns. And if you can get those folks in their areas where they're already saying right now, listen, I don't want the government involved. You help them gain more power in that area. Only the areas where they don't want government involved. None of the other areas. I don't want to talk to them about anything else. If progressives want to talk to me about guns, I don't want to talk to you about guns. If you're going to start off with common sense gun. No, 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 no. I can't even talk to you about that. That is not going to happen. But a lot of progressives want to talk to me about the, the drug war. About the, uh, the, the mandatory sentencing. Yeah. I totally want to work with you on that. I want to end the drug war. I want to end mandatory sentencing. I could totally get down with you on that. And the conservatives, they want to talk to me about getting regulations out of their business. Dude, I could totally, let's, let's, let's do what we can. And, and, you know, I'm not talking about going to the government and try to end regulations. I'm talking about building alternatives that make it more difficult for the government to, to enforce the rules and the regulations that they have. And then finally, the last uh, uh, area of influence in, in, in the way that I see power is, is, is course of action. It's, it's the threat of or the application of physical force to prevent or influence, well, to, I'll just say to influence an action that is not in uh, that is not directly harming another entity whether it's an individual group whatever the case might be and i mean directly man it's got to be like really 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 super directly and even then you're probably going to have some people fight over well what does that mean but uh uh i don't know uh <laughs> if if your starting premise is directly you're probably going to err a lot less on the side of taking course of action than you would if 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 your interpretation is well anything that might possibly somewhere down the road in one two three four five six seven twenty three steps uh hurt hurt another person or another entity and that's 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 the assumption that you have now that's that's the justification that they have now for for the course of action that they that they legitimize so there you have it. I am not an anarchist. I am a vis provusian. I believe in understanding the reality of power around you. And the reality of power is simply the ability uh, that you have to influence action, whether it's your own or others, and the ability that others have around you to influence your action. That is the reality of power. And coming to terms with exactly where you are in that, in, in, in so far as you possibly can, coming to terms with that is, is to me, much more effective than arguing over the freaking nap. Uh, although, if you want to argue for the nap, go ahead. And it's much more effective to me than going around and screeching uh, taxation is theft. Although, if you want to do that, that's fine, too. I don't care. It doesn't hurt. Well, maybe it does. I don't know. It, it, I don't think it does, but it could. I don't know. Uh, and, and to me, it's, it's far more effective than, well, it's far more effective than voting <laughs> and it's, and it's, and it's way more effective than declaring because of some high objective moral standard that this is what you're doing. 
No, man. If you, if you do that, you're hiding yourself from fully understanding who and what you are and what you really prefer. You're hiding behind ghosts. So I'm not going to hide behind ghosts. I'm not going to hide behind spooks. I'm just going to stand nakedly on my preference. And I will say I, 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 I have a suspicion that if you, if you see an environment begin to emerge where more and more people will have the ability to entertain this core preference, I personally believe, not 100% sure, but I personally believe that an overwhelming majority of people, I mean like 90 plus percent people, that they have at their core this preference and that they are prevented from accessing this preference in large part, in large part because of the, the influence of ideas, ideational influence, because of the idea of rule of law because of the idea of uh, the republic because of the idea of you know you know don't ask not what your country can do for you but what you can do for your country seriously that's held up as some sort of awesome quote ask not what you can do for your country but but what what well, not ask not what your country can do for you but what you can do for your country i mean that is a freaking commie John Kennedy, that is hardcore collectivism right there. And that's held up as one of the great quotes from one of the great American presidents. Because that idea, that idea is so powerful. And it, it's, it creates this, uh, this, this, this illusion of permanence, of is, was, always, will be. This, this e eternal presence within that cuts off critical thought. And... Yeah, that's one of the biggest reasons why I rail against uh, statements of 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 absolute morality. Right there, I think I think a belief. I I actually believe in absolute morality. I just don't believe that people fully uh, understand or can even comprehend what what actual objective morality is like whether whether you can or whether it exists or not and when i say i believe in absolute morality i don't absolutely believe in absolute morality <laughs> but i think i'm right i'm just not sure because i there's no way i could gather enough information to know that for sure but i rail against absolutarians as i call them because i believe that they're doing a lot of uh, harm they're they are they are cutting people off from critically understanding their own preferences and i believe that if more people really understood what their core preferences were a lot of them would come to see at that core it's it's this it's to be able to take action in which the threat of or application of physical force is 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 least a factor as possible and i think on that note i think i am done i have said my piece i have made my declarations and i will definitely be talking more i've i've been talking about this whole this previous thing for a while and i'm totally open by the way to folks if you have critiques if you you think there are more than four areas like i'm i i think uh social demonstrable uh, ideational and force influence. I think those are the four core areas where, where influence occurs. Everything that I can think of will fit into one of those four areas. And often, uh, it, it may actually fit into to more than one of those four areas. And so that's what I'm doing. And with iState.tv, I will be trying to produce, I'm still going to be to a certain degree highlighting exactly you know, the absurdity and ridiculousness and insanity and bloodthirsty nature of coercive associations. I'll certainly be covering that to a certain degree because I think that is effective. Uh, uh, to me, that's demonstrable influence. What I'm demonstrating there in these stories and highlighting these stories is is uh, this this is the, the demonstrable influence in the negative. You want to embrace the coercive association. Well, here's some of the side effects 
<laughs> of embracing the course of association. But more and more, I really want to focus on this, on 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 the positive, demonstrable influence, the ways in which we can actually build right here and right now alternatives to coercive associations, alternatives that that a lot of people will embrace, including progressives, including conservatives. And and I don't have to sell them the whole full meal deal of, of anarchy. I don't have to do that. All I got to sell them is, hey, uh, hey, conservatives, you hate Obamacare. Hey, Let's get involved with this whole, uh, you know, here, here, here are ways for you to form your own health care associations. Whatever it is, whatever, whatever area of your life you actually don't want the government involved in, whatever. That's what I want to know from people. What is the area in your life in which government is involved in which you wish it wasn't involved? Okay, in that area, how can I help you? Because I'm helping myself. How can I help you get to a place where you can you can reduce the influence and <laughs> of basically you can inf you can reduce the influence of the threat of or application of force in in the decisions that that you want to make for your own life and the action that you wish to take and on that note i'm going to end this uh this is i'm paul gordon of iState.tv and this is uh i guess i'm going to make this a uh, an I state podcast might be one of the actually you know what I'm gonna call this I'm gonna call this the inaugural Arc Logos podcast because you know in a lot of ways Arc Logos by the way is is a rule of word and it's meant ironically it's actually I'm uh, anti Arc Logos in the sense of uh, and when I say word I mean the human word uh, uh, how we use words to create these mythologies that. <laughs> that uh, take us away from understanding our core preferences. Uh, so Arc Logos is is really you know rule of word. It's the it's it's uh it's the it's the opposite of. And what I do in Arc Logos, what I will be doing in Arc Logos, and this is a this will be a podcast. It'll be very regular. It'll happen whenever it happens. Hey, th I planned Arc Logos a long time ago, and now guess what? This is the first ever episode of Arc Logos. There you go. Congratulations. There you go. So it'll it'll be themes that touch on this this uh, to, to tr that try to break the myth, the myth of arc logos of being ruled by words, and what that entails. All right. So on that note, I will go ahead and say goodbye. Thank you, everybody who joined the the show, such as it is. And if you didn't see the show live, well. Well, actually, if you didn't see the show live, you're not hearing this part anyway. But uh, there will be. Oh well, if you if you if you didn't hear all the show, there will be an archive of the show, obviously, so you can go back and play it. And I will also be loading this on YouTube. Good night, everybody.